Asante, hello and bonjour. We acknowledge that the land on which we gather is a traditional meeting ground and home for many indigenous peoples, including Cree, Soto, Blackfoot, Métis, and Nakota Sioux. We are grateful for the traditional knowledge keepers and elders who are with us today, those who have gone before us and the youth who inspire us. A tradition that dates back centuries, land recognition now calls us to acknowledge that we are Treaty 6 people, to remember our responsibility, to deepen our understand or understanding of the treaty, to participate in and support the ongoing process of truth, reconciliation and healing. Bienvenue, Tawau. Welcome to Westwood, everyone. A special welcome this morning to those who are first time visitors or consider themselves newcomers or, or who are returning after an extended absence. Westwood is a compassionate Unitarian Universalist community where you're welcome to explore your spiritual beliefs and decide for yourself what they may or may not be. Where you're welcome regardless of your gender, who you love, your wealth or your education. Where reverence for the earth and belief in the dignity of every person inform our ethics. Where music is an expression of our joy. Worship brings us together to celebrate what is important in our lives and acts of justice are a symbol of our hope. Today, we are co-leading this service. My name is Dawn Hunter. My pronouns are she and her. And my name is Pamela Bunga, and my pronouns are also she and her. And we are glad you joined us here today. And I'm glad you joined me here today, Pamela. <laughs> Our speaker this morning is Justin Pritchard, who will be talking about, in general terms, and sharing his personal exploration of mindfulness, non-duality, and spiritual awakening. Steve Bell is our musician, and I don't know if David's here to make coffee for us today or not, but if he, do, if he is, it's a blessing. Oh, there he is. Hi, David. <laughs> and our tech team is Hannah, Brenda and Bill. After the service, we invite all of you to visit, chat, and discuss any questions you may have. To receive information about our upcoming services and events, please sign the guest book, if you haven't done so already, um, on the table at the back and include your email address. You can also sign up to receive e -news, the e-newsletter on our website. Our opening words were written by Lisa Keynes from her book, For the Love of Everything. Body. What you think you are is not true. If you think that you are a good person, a bad person, a right person, or wrong person, all of that is not true. There might be a description of the body in that the body might have done something bad or good, but it is not a truth in any way. Language is in comparisons, so there can only be comparisons, so it cannot actually be true. What we have taken ourselves to be is the description of the body, whereas the description of the body is just something that is used in order to communicate. Doing something bad or forgetting something or even being in a peaceful per or even being a peaceful person is not an actual reality. Even if you were a peaceful person in comparison to the Dalai Lama, you might find out that you are not. No language can be true. Yet we spend most of our time living in this mental reality, this idea of ourselves. This mistake of believing that you are a somebody inside the body and a description of the body has become an energetic experience. It really feels like you are inside a body and controlling the body and making the body's reality real and, and that you are somebody separately walking through life in time. You think that you are the past actions and future actions, things that have done 
and things that, that you have done and things that you are going to do. It feels like thinking and action is coming from inside the body, but really the body is empty, absolutely empty. This emptiness is continually being covered up by a dream of, some, of being a someone in time. This idea makes this, or what we act is actually happening, to be seen through a lens or a veil. It is not you as a separate entity. It's you as a separate entity interpreting what is happening with all your past and future experiences. What is, is then not seen as it is, but rather it is seen through a film or veil of you. You are not the body, and you are not the story, but rather the body and its stories are arising in this. Hearing this may begin to loosen that focus on me, me, me in time, and that energetic contradiction of a me in a storyland. In a way, nothing will loosen anything or not loosen anything because it never really even happened. So I was given this, yes, right? I was given this, uh, these words from Justin, and uh, I printed them off at work, and I put it beside my, my computer. And I think I read this probably about 11 or 12 times, very slowly. And after every sentence, I just kind of slowly thought. And after a while, it did have a really interesting effect. I started to feel a sensation, something, a sense of lightness, and a bit of an openness. My mind felt a little bit more relaxed. So if, you, if anybody wants a copy of this, let me know, and um, I can send it to you. Good morning again. We're going to have our first hymn. It's number 10,009, Meditation on Breathing. And I invite Rebecca to come forward and teach, us, teach it to us and conduct us through it. Part harmony piece of music. I can go get some hymn books if some people would like a hymn book. Okay, so um, the first part is I'm just going to do the, the one note. Okay, does it breathe in first? So, for those of you who would like to be the drone today, that might be the lower voices, but your choice. It, it just goes. Breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out, just over and over, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. Yeah. Then uh, the tune begins before, breathe, it's like this, when I breathe in. There is a third part that goes and one. When I breathe in, I breathe in. For those of you who would like to stay on that part, it would be great if we had somebody droning all the time. And then I'll bring in, when I breathe in, and then I'll bring in, when I breathe in, 
Okay, I'm going to keep on singing when I breathe in uh, the talk part. All right. Okay, so candles of joy and concern. Edda's favorite thing. <laughs> candles of joy and concern is a moment in our week that gives us the opportunity to hear and express something important that is going on in our lives and the lives of those around us, to celebrate what brings us joy, and to share what is weighing on our hearts. For those of us who are online, Please raise your hand so that we can acknowledge you. And for those who are in the building, you're invited to come forward and speak. Then light your candle as the next person speaks or to light a candle in silence. We are also happy to bring the microphone to you if you wish. And we're doing the candles the old fashioned way. We're reverting back from our little electronic tool. So we just ask that you do be aware of possible candle wax flying everywhere. Um, and now we light one final candle for all those joys and concerns that remain unexpressed in our hearts. Please join me for the affirmation. May the light of these candles inspire us to use our power to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to serve the spirit of truth in loving affection and trusting hope. Each week, during our Sunday service, we take a few minutes to acknowledge the gifts we both bring to and receive from this compassionate community. Gifts of talent, time, and treasure. Today we're blessed with the musical talent of Steve Bell, as well as the gifts of time and service from those who plan, greet, coordinate our sound and video systems, and clean up after. If you wish to make a gift of treasure, the information for doing so is in the right hand is on the right hand of this slide. Now for the juicy part. Embarking on a spiritual journey, Justin has practiced mindfulness for over a decade, experiencing a transformative awakening in 2014. As the former president of a mindfulness group at the University of Alberta, he helped foster a vibrant spiritual and wellness community on campus. Currently, Justin works as a sessional faculty member at the U of A, guiding creative exploration for design students. He is also pursuing a Doctor of Education degree while supporting MBA students as a career coach, helping them to navigate career and life's uncertainties with confidence. So a warm welcome to Justin, 
and thank you for agreeing to come and speak to us today. Looking forward. Thank you. Thank you, Don. I'm assuming we can hear me. I'm just going to share my screen. And let me present. Oh, give me a sec. All right. Thank you, Westwood, for inviting me here. This is a very unique experience for me as well. Um, it's a story that I would say in my life, not many people know, all of you will know shortly. Um, you know, I will be talking about mindfulness, but actually more so a, a non-dual awakening, which is a unique experience and was very unexpected in my life. And something that um, I hope kind of shed some light on maybe a new way of looking at yourself as a human and your consciousness. So I want to even start with the story itself and how I'm going to communicate this whole presentation is kind of at, as a foundation, my story, and then some of the teachings and the takeaways and the inspiration I gained from it through other teachers, people who inspired me to kind of further explore non-duality. And um, even beyond that, I've started to explore non um, near death experiences. So I want to start with the story and I'm going to call it the dissolve. So there will be some images here. These are just filler, like uh, exemplifying my experience and I'll explain a little bit. Um, so back 2014, um, I had experienced a traumatic experience within my life. Um, I had a partner at the time and um, unexpectedly they separated from me. And this was during a time we were planning on living together. Um, I also had a mindfulness practice for many years and it, it seemed to be kind of a conflict in my life because I thought I had this equanimity or this even mindedness in my life but that soon changed in this experience I felt very disoriented um, I was also graduating from one of my masters and I really hadn't a, a strong sense of purpose in my life um, and um, oh there's background sound sorry there was a audio that I didn't mean to keep on. I think that might be better now. Um, okay, so during this time, this experience, um, I had quite a bout of anxiety and um, I didn't really know the direction of my life. I just felt a, a, a sadness deep kind of in my heart. And I was sitting in a cafe and with no particular reason, just sitting there. And um, I felt kind of hopeless, I would say. I didn't really know what to do next in my life. But at the same time, there was this feeling sense of something opening up. But for no particular deliberate reason, it just something opened up in my inner experience. It was a feeling sense. And then almost like a surrendering that was happening on its own. Um, a feeling like this sadness was lifting. And I, I, I didn't practice anything beforehand it was just lifting from me and it was kind of escaping me and I, I was a little bit confused of what was happening um I got up and I moved away I got out of the cafe and I started walking and I looked up and I couldn't believe my eyes everything around me was alive like I've never seen in in my whole life it was like everything was radiating with aliveness um, I could almost see every single leaf. I could see saturation of color that I've never seen in ever. Um, and there was this expansion, a complete expansion. And as I was walking, my sense of self was disappearing. This, this entity, this idea of Justin was just disappearing. And it was almost like if you're letting out the air from a balloon and it was just going, 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 but at the same time, I felt fully alive. I kept walking and walking. And I realized that I was literally everywhere. There was no location. I had no sense of Justin in this body. 
it was Justin everywhere, but it wasn't even Justin. It was just, oh, this very calm feeling of I'm everything and everywhere and everyone is everything and everywhere. You know, I kept walking and walking and I couldn't stop. And I, I had this feeling sense that something was almost um, like startling. Like this was not an experience that other I've heard of other people's having before. I almost felt like something was wrong, but at the same time, it felt so natural, this feeling of being everywhere. I looked up at the sky and it was so clear. And what I realized in that moment is I had not a single thought, not, not even an ounce of a thought running through my head. And I had been practicing mindfulness for many years. And even when I practiced, I, I, you know, I would have a busy mind. I mean, we all have busy minds. My minds wander all the time, but there was not a single thought. So I almost thought like of like the sky as this awareness. And I just became this awareness that was absolutely everywhere. And that the clouds themselves were thoughts, but I hadn't, there wasn't a cloud in the sky. There wasn't a thought in my mind. I went home. So this is just an, exemplified this is an e example of my roommate it's not my roommate but I my roommate and I had a very cordial relationship it was kind of more of like a pragmatic neutral relationship but when I got home and I looked at them there was this profound sense of love that was just not only radiating from me and around me this body but them and I was smiling ear to ear and I, I had no sense of why there was no, it was a causeless happiness when I was looking at my roommate and I just was in disbelief. Like, where is this love coming from? It is being infused into everything, my body outside of my body, my roommate, everything. The only thing I could think to do in that moment as I had a mindfulness coach, someone who I was practicing mindfulness, but she helped guide and kind of deepen my practice. And when I say mindfulness, I'm talking about this practice, which is the act of noticing what's arising in the moment. So it can be as simple as watching your breathing, can be as simple as, um, uh, you know, noticing sounds around you. Um, but I had a mindfulness coach. And so I thought, what if I email her? Because I knew she came from a Buddhist background. And I thought maybe there's something related to a wisdom tradition here that I'm experiencing that I can't articulate. Um, and I did understand a little bit of Buddhism, like the eight, um, the noble path or the eightfold path I had heard of and this idea of no self, but I didn't really understand what it was. And I emailed her and I just explained this explosion that had happened, this expansion into everything and telling her that I didn't exist anymore. There, I didn't even know where Justin was. It was just everything everywhere. And kind of in a unique way, she replied concisely which is was unusual for her because every time her and I corresponded through email it was very elaborative like she was very verbose but the email reply was hi Justin this is good welcome it is well that you have come continue looking at the world that has always been here tis marvelous is it not thanks for sharing this is good welcome and of course I read this and I thought well that doesn't answer some of these uncertainties of what's happening. What does this term welcome mean? It was really unclear. But there was also this feeling of, oh, I understand what welcome means. Because I felt welcomed into this aliveness that is always here, this pervasive aliveness that's around us. So for the next, um, I would say two days, I had just kind of simplified my life and I spent a lot of time sitting in nature still not a single thought in my head not a thought about Justin being somewhere in time and space nothing it was completely empty and um, I just observed and it felt like I was this awareness that was everywhere and it was blissful it was one of the most remarkable things um, I have ever experienced in my life, um, so much so that it kind of guided the next phase of my life since, since this experience and really deepened my understanding of what happened.
And this is just something to think about for yourself. I mean, I'll keep it more as like a rhetorical question, but, you know, think about, you know, what makes you this feeling, this sense of aliveness. And there could be a certain activity you engage in, in your life. It could be certain people. And when I say a sense of aliveness, I'm just talking about this collapse of thinking and this sense of time and space that you are completely in the now, in the present. And the presence surrounds you. You know, and for some people, it is art making, could be sports, could be being with children, grandchildren. But what if I was to say that that sense of aliveness is available at any moment and it doesn't require any activity particularly? that you can feel that aliveness right here, right now, and ongoingly. And that's kind of what I want to talk about. So, non-duality. Now, for many people, they have probably never heard this term before. I had never heard of it either. I had um, someone in my life, uh, he, he had written a book, actually. Um, he he was also a coach kind of teaching around mindfulness and whatnot. And um, I had a session with him kind of after this experience and I had explained it and he brought up the term non-duality because he had also an experience where he had a collapse of thinking where all his thoughts kind of disappeared. And he told me to look into non-duality. He didn't explain it to me. He just said, look into it. And he gave a few teachers in the area. And he said that some of the teachings come from wisdom traditions but to only listen to teachings that resonated because there were many people who talk about non-duality, but only pay attention to the ones that resonate. So before I kind of talk about some of those people and what they have to say about this, what, am I what, what do I mean by the term non-duality? So non-duality really means not to, or um, if we think about non-duality as non-dual awareness, an awareness, because I keep using this term awareness, a non-dual awareness is the state of consciousness where the distinction between the observer, so the I, the sense of I, and the observed, whatever I'm observing, dissolves. And it leads to a profound sense of unity and interconnectedness with all of existence. And that definition very much resonates for me because that was my direct experience. There was no subject and object. It was just one thing. Now, like I said earlier, there was a lot of inspiration after this moment because I went on a deep dive, I would say. I would call it a deep dive. And each one of these people made a mark in my life. And this isn't even all the influencers. There are many more. But I read many books, watched many videos, listened to many audio teachings from each one of these people to really kind of start to situate this experience I have and to make sense of it. Now, kind of preparing for this presentation was interesting because it's been years since some of these names have made a mark on my life, but I was able to kind of rekindle some of my interest in some of these teachers. And some of them are actual formal non-dual teachers. Some of them come from Buddhist tradition, um, which, which is different, but um, they also made a mark in my life. And some are more secular. Now, this is kind of a strange image. I just blurred out a bunch of it because it's actually my email. At the time in my life, I had a busy life because I had to finish my master's. I was working a lot. So my journal was to literally email myself. And if I zoom in here, you'll see I emailed myself in a short period of time, 50 times, 50 times explaining this experience to myself and some of these teachers teachings to better understand what I was, how I was making sense of this kind of spiritual experience, I would call it. Um, and some of these emails were just pure free writing, kind of pages and pages and pages of thoughts. And the reason why I mention this, I'm, there's a reason why I'm mentioning this. Um, alongside this slide, this is just a screen capture of all these files on my computer that I went back to recently. I kind of had to study myself a little bit to prepare for this because it's been a while since I um, kind of re-examined the topic. But half of these are just videos, pictures, audios. Some of them are on the, the right side is actually images 
or visual metaphors that help me understand the topic. So I screen captures different images or people describing images that made me understand non-duality better. So as I was preparing for this, I had to go back and almost examine all of that again and really pull out who are some of the key players, the key influencers within my life. And I want to talk a little bit about what they have to say about the topic, because I don't claim to be a, t a spiritual teacher and nor am I trying to be a spiritual teacher. That's I don't feel my role in this life. Um, but I want to highlight some of their kind of key concepts and hopefully you can take something away from them as well. So I'm going to be talking about these different bullet points that come from some of the teachings. So I'm not going to talk about the slide in detail right now, but I'll use this as kind of like a chapter slide that I'll go point by point. And I'm going to talk about it in relation to this concept of non-duality. And it says here, there can be an experiential recognition. And this is very important, this terminology, experiential recognition. This is not an intellectualization, like meaning we can sort of makes sense of what I'm going to be talking about, but truly it's it's something experiential. And we may have all encountered some of these experiences within our life and recognize what I'm going to be talking about. And that's where the true understanding of non-duality is. And at one point, I'll share a little bit of about some practices that anyone can do to um, kind of move towards a, that non-dual awareness, even though there will be a disclaimer around that. Okay, so the first point, now, now, now. So one of the main people, and still today, and their name in my mind is like a mantra, actually, Gary, Gary Weber. And in this video on YouTube, he's talking to Rich Doyle, who's a professor. And Gary is a PhD. He was a scientist. He led a... Uh, uh, a very elaborate career. And he also practiced Zen meditation for many, many years, decades, actually, not even years, decades. And in one moment, he had a similar experience where the leaf turned, where he was doing a pose, a yoga pose, and thoughts disappeared and never returned for him. And he does a lot of teachings now, kind of a merge between kind of a more secular view of the topic and bringing back some of the wisdom tradition topics too. In this video, there's just a few things I'm going to read as it relates to this idea of now, now, now. That's what the video is called. So Gary says, the now is much more pregnant and powerful than the intersection between the past and the future. And in another part of the video, Rich says, there can be no issues in the now. And Gary says, the brain loves the now. It's such a sweet yes space. And you may have experienced this directly. Again, that experiential recognition when you're completely immersed into what's happening, that no overlay of a story can make the situation better, but you are so immersed into now that it is a yes space. It's this, this yes now feels right. And for Gary, now, now, now is all he experiences. There is no sense of a past or a future. That is kind of an illusion in a way. It's a story. But really all that there is, is now. Now, Gary, um, he has a blog and he's getting a bit older now. And I'm not sure how much he's doing teachings, to be honest with you. Um, he does have a YouTube channel and you can look at some of his older videos. His blog is great because he brings in here, actually, he's talking about neuroscience, the default mode network, and how a certain... Um, network in the brain creates the sense of time and space. And that there's another part of the brain that creates a sense of I as a solid separate entity. And that if that network can be deactivated, there can be just a pure sense of being present. Not even the idea of being present that you are, it's just all there is, is presence. And that this presence, if you become it and expand into it, that there isn't a solid separate self. So I'm just sharing this screenshot because um, still today I connect with a lot of his uh, his blog entries and whatnot. Happinessbeyondthought.blogspot. 
Now, sticking with this idea of now, 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 Lisa can. So this was from the reading earlier. Dawn had made a, uh, had read that out. I had shared the reading. This is from her book that, where that reading was. She's also has a remarkable story. And to this day, she does many live sessions um, where she talks about kind of non-duality and the human experience. And this video, it's called The Empty View. So she says, you don't need to be in the now. You are the now. All the dynamics kept me in the past and the future. Always trying to get something or avoid something just fell away or which fell away. It was seen that I always was and always am in the now. There's always just this moment. And when she talks about the term dynamics, it's these human dynamics, right? It's the seeking energy, this always wanting Again, what she's saying here, striving for something, wanting something more, whether it's a desire or trying to avoid something, whether it's pain or this, this idea of suffering. But in essence, that you are the now itself. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next point here. So you are not the doer. Jack O'Keefe. So this video on YouTube is called I Am Am Not the Doer. Jack O'Keefe, this, this is from years ago, this video when she lived in an ashram in India. Um, she just has like an amazing spiritual background. I can't even summarize it, to be honest with you, but she just has explored so many different traditions and understandings. And now she kind of teaches teachers about spirituality she's from ireland so in this video she says there is no i that is separate from the massive energy that we call creation the i has to break such as the busyness of mind and the identification with roles as the mind breaks something that's left always remains and it's not an i but the mind is so used to the two or two there's me and something. But it's very possible, like what's being said here, that the mind can break. And not break in a negative way, but there can be just this opening where you can deliberately or like you can um, see so clearly that the I is just a story. It's just a story. Because in the absence of that, there is no I. Um, again, it goes back to kind of clouds in the sky that we believe we are. Let's, let's imagine the clouds as thoughts that we believe we are the thoughts. I am mad. I am happy. I am this. I am Justin. I'm an academic. I'm a doctoral student. I'm this. I'm that. But there is something observing those thoughts because you can actually witness a thought bubble up from nowhere and disappear into nowhere. So if there's an observing quality, how can you be? the thought, observing the thoughts disappear. There's a sky there that's a vast awareness and that you are the awareness itself, observing everything without being an observer. It's just an awareness. So everything is that awareness. And again, kind of in the absence of that, the busy mind and so much that goes on with the busy mind it's just this emptiness, this pure emptiness, which ironically, which is so ironic, it is so full at the same time. This emptiness is everywhere. So it's the fullness of emptiness or the emptiness that is full. So this was one that startled me, is that you don't exist. A book that I would recommend is Gary Weber's book, there are many kind of practices. It's very practical. I well, it's called the Practical Guide to Awake Awakening. And in the book, at the very beginning, I'm going to read this out. This is something that I read, and it it shook me. It says there will be much discussion of non-duality, also known as Advaita, in Sanskrit. That's A for not, and Dvaita two. So not two. There's 
These terms simply mean that everything is really one thing, even though it appears to be a bunch of subjects and objects. It also logically follows that you as a separate entity don't exist in the way that you think you do. It is bad news, good news story. The bad news is that you don't exist. Actually, it isn't so bad or that bad. The good news is that you're everything, not a bad trade. So Gary Weber, he was inspired by Ramana Maharshi. Maybe some of you know of Ramana Maharshi who follows Advaita Vedanta. That's the kind of more traditional view of non-duality. So many teachings from Ramana Maharshi. So when we're talking about you don't exist, there's a quote here. What appears and disappears doesn't exist. Because how can it exist if it disappears and appears? So again, going back to this idea of the clouds in the sky and the idea of self is just a thought, but thoughts come and go. Okay, peer functioning. Okay, back to Jack O'Keefe. So there's a video here, Jack O'Keefe um, doing a teaching and it's called peer functioning, the video. So there's something just functioning once the duality pulls away. The rest of it is labeling as a result of conditioned condition thinking, that's all. Every ego thinks it knows how things should be and should be done. And again, the idea that if thoughts drop away, how would Justin, this body, mind mechanism, how would it function? Well, it will. Because when I had no thoughts, I still was doing the dishes, going for walks, doing my homework. It still happened without the I thought. There were still certain kind of background thoughts that were more kind of planning oriented and um, but they didn't have a sense of an I to it. So there's a certain thought that comes up that is I live in time and space and do this and that and have this belief and have that belief and I must do this in my life and must do that. That falls away. And then peer functioning happens without a doer. So what you are, dot, dot, dot. There's a little video clip that I'm going to play. It was um, done by Jack O'Keefe. I think it's really well done. Up close and personal, suffering happens. When we are distracted by our human experience, we readily believe our minds. We fail to recognize the infinite expanse of our true nature. Lose interest in the stories of your mind. Observe your thoughts and your emotional concerns fade out. The drama of your personal story dissolves as you shift your attention from thinking to stillness. There is peace, rest and contentment. Be unattached to the world and take your cue from within. Resistance comes, let it pass. Fear can arise and it passes also. Your inner true nature is not touched by any of this. From this wider view, nothing is excluded. The prevalence of the whole unified system is at the forefront. You recognize that you are pure consciousness shaped into a human being. Your true nature plays with possibilities and expressions in what you imagine as your personal life. Phenomenal experience is volatile and does not require your attention. Your true nature is changeless and witnesses all experience. Rest in what is natural. Maintain a deep abidance within yourself. Let there be pure seeing without comment. Pure perception is not clotted by the mind. Let consciousness itself expand and it becomes empty. All concepts disappear. Identify your point of perception. What you are looking for is where you're looking from. Hey, I'll go to the next slide here. Oops, this doesn't play again. Next. Um, before I comment on this slide, um, 
so when it says what you are what you are dot 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 it's the last point there is what you are looking for is where you are looking from i think that's a very powerful statement along the same um kind of theme you could say gongaji very well known um as a teacher probably one of the most well known in the kind of modern day world she says what you are seeking is what you already are but isn't that so interesting because so much of our lives we are in a seeking hold we are kind of like prisoned by the seeking pattern that we have seeking a better moment seeking something else seeking a better life seeking an awakening seeking a more spiritual life but if we can just collapse that those those are thoughts and ideas just collapse that all that what remains is what you're seeking and that what remains what is looking through my eyes right now is the same thing looking through your eyes it's the same energy it's the same awareness So you are awareness, but not in the observing, I'm an observer, aware, doing awareness. It's not quite like that. So Jim Eaton, I would say he made a mark in my um, life, but maybe in a more subtle way. But I did always really appreciate this video that he had done. And there's a few excerpts I'll pull out and share. So you are awareness, you are life itself. So a new default. So you can be this new default as an awareness that just is. Awareness that is inseparable and indivisible from sounds, sensations, images, thoughts, feelings, smells, and tastes. So awareness just is life. It's not observing life. You, awareness, are life. And what that means, just for me to break that down a little bit, when it says sounds, sensations, is that there isn't a distinction between the listener and the sound or the taster and the taste. It's the same thing. Okay, and this is another very important um, realization is that everything is love. So this is the book cover Don Hunter had read from earlier, a chapter. So this how this book works is Lisa Cans, she does teachings online and she has followers. And one of her followers, um, I think what they did was translate some of her teachings. And so really the book is just um, her teachings that were put into written form. And I think there are different versions, like there's a Spanish version and an English and other languages. So another part of the book, talking about everything is love. So Lisa says, all there is, is love. Even the act of personal love that thinks and wishes and hopes and longs for love is love. Everything is love. This is not just you experiencing life or you loving everything. As the me dissolves, you will see that everything has always been love. Everything is an act of love. Everything is love manifesting as nothing. All of this is an absolute love affair. And I just want to mention, um, I heard the word love used quite a bit at the beginning of this um, sermon, or not the sermon, the um, ceremony today, or how you call them. And I thought the, it, it, every time I heard the word love, you know, I feel like in all the wisdom traditions and beliefs, love always comes up as something that prevails. Okay, so how can this be experienced? At one point or another, you might be sitting there thinking, okay, this, this is interesting. Um, it, it might seem a little bit bizarre, if this is kind of new, and it may challenge even existing beliefs or 
um, understandings. But then it might be think, well, Justin had an awakening or some sort of experience. Like, how are how has this happened for others? Now, it's a little bit of an irony. There are some teachers that say there's nothing you can do because there is no doer. So who would be doing the experiencing or who would be doing the practices and who would be who would be the one awakening? But even that thought itself is useful because it helps kind of stunt the mind a bit. Who, who, who am I? What is the I? So in a way, there could be potentially some practices that can be done. Now, again, I'm going to go back to Gary Weber's book. Is the, if this topic is of interest to you, what I'm talking about today, I would, I would look into this book. Again, I'm not a teacher, so I think referring is probably my best option, but I can share a little bit of what I did as kind of like a DIY, do-it-yourself approach based on gleaning information from many different teachers and whatnot. Because after those three days of this kind of expansion, the sense of an I did return, but it had a different position. It became in the background. And I wanted to just kind of push it even further in the background, again, I, um, because it was like a radio in the background and I, it was still a little bit noisy. So my thought was, what if there's these different kind of practices that could kind of um, deepen my understanding of a non-dual state? So I will share a few just very quickly. Give me a sec here. Okay. Um, so it back, there was that video I showed, like the screenshot of a video I showed earlier with Rich Doyle and Gary Weber. And Rich in the video, he says, the self-inquiry questions can be good for staying in the now. So what does that mean? I think that this is probably the most powerful practice non-dual practice, if we want to say that there are practices. It means inquiring or questioning what you are. What am I? When am I? Where am I? And really sit with that and let there be a stillness there. Try not to use the intellectual part of the mind to make sense of it all. But sitting in the silence, well, really kind of allowing that question to settle. When you think about when when am I, let's say, there are so many versions. This is a bit blurry. This is a slide from Gary's presentation, not mine, but so I want to give him credit. But he talks about the I is built by our conditioning and our socialization and whatnot. And there are we have all these roles. So in this case, the I could be when do they show up? They show up as a poor singer at times, but maybe later on as a good singer or good at math or they love to party or there's all these different eyes. It's like these ad hoc eyes and we are built up of them. We're not just one, but then how can we be all these different eyes? I mean, they are coming and going. Really questioning when am I or where am I? Even where am I? Where does the I reside? Is it in the head? Because when I stub my foot, that localization, it seems as though the eye is there. But then what I experience is that there can be the feeling of no sense of eye. Neddy neddy practices. So this means not this, not, or sorry, not this, not that, as I believe what it actually means, or not this, not this. So, you know, doing some practices where you say, you know, I am not the body and really sitting with that in the stillness, or I'm not the mind. Gary would say that one of the biggest challenges with being human is that we have a lot of attachments, which are kind of like stories that we have. We want to keep the things the way they are. We want to let go of them. But each attachment has an eye woven or twisted into it. And so even letting go practices and letting go practices come from all different paths and traditions and religious backgrounds, letting go is very important. Even the act of asking yourself if you could let go is useful. It can even do something with the brain where 
it can imagine a possibility. So let's say I feel attached to my partner. I can imagine, could I let go of my partner? And you might, there might be a feeling sense of tension or resistance, but sitting with that, and that's where mindfulness is useful, is just sitting with that can be useful. But really asking yourself, can you let go of these strong attachments in your life? Over time, there can be a loosening within. Another useful thing is trying to put your um, attention to the source of a thought. Like I said earlier, you can notice, you can actually very subtly notice thoughts kind of pop up and back into nowhere. Um, mantras are very useful. So something that I used to say a lot is nothing's actually happening right now. There's a lot of motion, but it's nothing's actually really happening and that you're not the body and you don't exist. And at first I will say that this might just not make sense because we as humans are very attached to the body as a thing, separate thing, and that I am the body. Um, Non-labeling. So, you know, being able to, let's say, go for a mindful walk and not trying to label what you're seeing, just observing. And I would say this alone, you know, won't, I don't think, it could lead to a, a non-dual state. I think self-inquiry is probably more effective, but non-labeling can be very useful to kind of get into that more observing zone where you're just observing, not labeling this, that, good, bad, right, wrong. Um, something that could be useful as well is dropping every thought like a hot potato. Imagine a thought if you could just drop it completely. And obviously we need certain thoughts, like certain pragmatic thoughts, but I'm talking about the I thoughts that are very problematic, that want a better life, want this to change, want this and that. Imagine dropping that completely. When you go for a walk or, or doing, a, let's say you're doing a prayer or a sitting meditation in silence, Try to notice the stillness that is always there, that's always in motion. So there's motion happening, I'm moving, but there's a stillness that is pervasive. It's ubiquitous as well, it's everywhere. And that stillness can deepen. And then obviously, like I've mentioned, is you know finding non-dual teachers that can be, um, that resonate for you. And even if searching in YouTube, non-dual, non-dual teaching, you'll start to kind of stumble into many and just like putting it in the background and just listening to it um, without much regard for um, trying to attach to it as a belief system. So just one other thing to mention about practices is that I think like any practice, there needs to be a persistence involved. Lisa, she was a teacher I followed for a while. Just a few points to read here. So your hair has to be on fire. You don't think of anything else but to put it out. It takes everything to, re to realize truth, to know what it is externally, sorry, to know what is externally still and present. There's a fierceness that must occur in the face of so much doubt. She says, enough control, enough doubt, enough indulgence, enough lust, enough emotion, enough emotional trauma. Yes, it's very serious, but on the other side of this seriousness is something that is so beautiful and divine. So what about today for me? Going back to kind of my story. So like I said, there is a semblance or a sense of an eye, but it is very far in the background. It is essentially this radio that's just kind of in the background. And more recently, I kind of stepped away from like the non-dual teachings and whatnot. Well, I would say that's not more recently. That was kind of over the last few years, just spending my life being, just being, and not really delving into this too much, but I did stumble into something I want to kind of address 
kind of at the end here of my as my presentation kind of closes off. And I was able to rekindle my interest in this topic through not um, near death experience stories because I found a very unique relationship between the two, kind of these non dual awake awakenings and near death experiences. Now, I'm not going to talk too much about it, but I want to talk a little bit about it. So if you're not familiar with near-death experiences, I'm sure many of you are, you've probably heard about them. You may have known people or had one yourself, but they say it's a vivid and unusual experience that some people report when they are close to dying, which can include sensations like leaving their body, white light, um, mystical experiences. So those would be experiences of like um, being seeing or being the divine or God and whatnot. And sometimes, and this is where the relationship lies between non-duality, sometimes people experience a sense of interconnectedness and oneness with all. So just to point at these five things or these key points that I feel are the overlaps between non-dual awakenings and near-death experiences, that sense of unity and oneness, the dissolu um, dissolution or the dissolving of boundaries and this sense of body, kind of leaving the body, an altered perception of time and space or the absence of that just now, the transcendence of fear of death. Many people who have a non-dual awakening have no sense of fear or death as it like um, a fear towards death because they might argue that kind of it's like a death well alive because there's a death of the ego and the identity and then insights and wisdoms can be kind of downloaded in both experiences now i'm just there's two very short video clips that i'm going to play and i just want to show them to kind of show that there's this relationship so this is um a doctor who has many years of experience with near-death experiences and the accounts of them so she studied different stories and she talks a little bit about her understanding of like how this happens because some people believe you know is it part of the brain that it's producing this experience or is it beyond the brain is it something that's beyond human so again this is just her perspective it's not a truth what makes more sense to me is that the brain is a mediator of consciousness so it doesn't produce it but it kind of mediates it and so the brain if you like acts like a, a filter and I think that this heightened state of consciousness is around us all the time and it's primary but we're not aware of that because our brain acts like a filter and it, it filters it out. Now there are times in our life where that filter action of the brain relaxes a bit and that could be due to physiological changes that occur during trauma or during the experiences lead um circumstances lead into the near-death experience and what that does is expands the the filter of the brain and it allows this heightened state of consciousness into our everyday reality so these people the sensory input that we constantly receive every second of the day it kind of stops because the brain isn't functioning as it would do normally and so people access this heightened state of consciousness which is always there but we can't perceive it nor under normal circumstances okay and then what i want to do is actually just compare that to someone who had kind of a non-dual awakening here in trace and this is just an even shorter clip so again, what I just showed you was someone talking about near-death experiences, which are different than non-dual awakenings. So what happens when we lose the filter that was um, kind of compartmentalizing memory, experience, story into like my life or my last two years, right? That blows out. And now in comes this beautiful, effortless, incredible presence. And it hits these multiple layers of your body that are storing these beliefs, these stories. 
I think both of them had talked about the word filter and what happens when that filter ex explodes in a way or blows out or it just kind of dissolves. And there's this expansion that's always there, this consciousness. So I'm nearing the end of my presentation. And I suppose, you know, there was a lot of different points that I talked about. Um, I think take what you will from it. Um, I, I, I don't expect it all to resonate. Sometimes it takes time to sit with some of this content matter. Um, I know when I started to listen to Lisa Kahn's talks, my I would feel almost a little bit nauseous. It just felt like too much. Just It was just a lot. And it didn't always make sense. Um, but I mean, this point I really want to highlight as I close, maybe something to percolate for each one of us, is that what you're looking from, or sorry, what you're looking for, should be what you're looking for is where you're looking from. And I think if we kind of take this lens of maybe knowing that there's something beyond this human body state and kind of have a um, an openness that we could be beyond the body and that maybe this eye is just an illusion that there could be a different way of life and i imagine what the world would look like because at the end of it all there is or the the center of it all everything is love and i think what would that look like if life was guided by that if we all had more of this sense of this the true love that we actually are all right thank you very much to join us in singing the second hymn, The Oneness of Everything. It's 1052 and it should be up on the slide.
The lit candle flame represents the light of the Dharma and is symbolic of the state of enlightenment. The flame can also represent the impermanence of form. In this way, candles are a bridge between both realities. They are the realm of form, yet also in touch with the infinite, ever renewing compassion from which all forms arise. The state of enlightenment is not represented by the blowing out of the candle. It is that the candle can finally be extinguished because the sun has arisen and daylight has come. May peace, awareness, intention, laughter, inspiration, and the memory of this flame light the rest of your day. <laughs>